So welcome, Svath Marie and Terry Deacon. Um, I'm so happy to be having this conversation with you about the science of the noosphere. Uh, that term, of course, was coined by uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, but it maps very importantly onto another concept, which is major evolutionary transitions um, that uh, you have both had a large uh, impact on the history of that topic. So let me begin by asking you just to introduce yourselves a little bit. Um, you're very well known in some circles, but our audience is very, very broad. So please just introduce yourself as people and how you became scientists. Uh, say how Tehard entered your thoughts to the degree that he did. And then we'll swiftly get to the concept of um, major evolutionary transitions, which will be the unifying thread of this conversation. So uh, Rose, why don't you begin? And then, uh, and then Terry. So greetings, uh, I'm Urs Satmari. I am an evolutionary biologist, theoretical biologist as you wish. And uh, uh, very early on, I became interested in the question of the origin of life. This is why chemistry is a second language to me. Uh, but then uh, my interest became generalized as it were. And then in the mid nineties, I became very much excited uh, by what now we call, together with the late John Maynard Smith, the major evolution transitions. And that means that uh, throughout the history of life, there have been a number of steps during which complexity increased, a uh, lower level separately reproducing uh, entities came together to form a higher level who. And also, there has been a change in the way how inheritance works, for example. So it's not only DNA that uh, operates, uh, you know, as a base of inheritance, but we also have language, for example, that we are using now. And obviously, before writing, that was the only way how you could transmit useful information that was complicated. Um, so, I mean, the, the comparative approach to all these questions uh, keeps fascinating me and I'm working actively on several uh, uh, of the transitions in between, but not all of them. And uh, uh, I have not been very much influenced by Taylor de Chardin. I think that uh, the noosphere is uh, an interesting idea and probably that we are going to discuss it. The omega point we might discuss as well towards which we might be evolving. Uh, I'm very doubtful about that, but it's very important to say that Taylor de Chardin was a Jesuit who came from the church, but he took evolution extremely seriously. And that led, you know, later, much later, you, to very important developments also within the church. You know, that uh, John Paul II, you, 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 you know, the famous uh, uh, declaration where it starts that evolution is more than a hypothesis. And I think that, uh, that uh, uh, Taylor de Chardin had a very important role in that change. And also currently Pope Francis, uh, has said appreciative words of Taylor de Chardin. So uh, things are changing, and uh, and I think that uh, that uh, some of his ideas are rather stimulating and more timely than than during the times when he wrote. Right, that's great. Uh, Terry, over to you. So my background is um, in many respects parallel, but in a different domain. Um, I actually encountered Teilhard's work fairly early in my career, but it played almost no role until very recently. Um, I was probably uh, initiated in the direction of my thinking um, by reading the early works of uh, many people in systems theory, cybernetic theory, and so on. But it wasn't until I encountered the uh, philosophical and semiotic work of Charles Sanders Peirce that I sort of really got sort of a direction in my thinking. And uh, although I had intended to pursue this in a philosophical direction, um, when I found myself at Harvard where I thought I would study Peirce's work, I ended up becoming much more interested in the neurosciences and did my work in terms mostly of the evolution of brains. 
uh, in particular looking at the evolution of the human brain. And the link to, to my studies with Charles Peirce uh, and his work uh, had to do with language and how unusual language was. And so I spent um, all through the 80s and early 90s struggling to answer the question, what's unique about human brains that makes this very unusual way of communicating possible? Um, in the process, I studied even with, with Noam Chomsky, uh, uh, who became, in effect, uh, a strong opponent uh, of my work and I of his. And we have ever since been that, in part because uh, I felt that we need to sort of look at the, both the biology and the underlying semiotic arguments behind language that we're missing. Uh, in the mid-90s, when I encountered the, the work that Orsch and John Maynard Smith um, were involved in, um, I also recognized, while I was writing my first book, The Symbolic Species, actually it's my second book, I should say, but while I was writing that book, it became very clear to me that the transition to language was also a major transition. Uh, and um, even though I was not well uh, versed in the early 90s with that kind of thinking, it became a major driver for my thinking, as did an idea which later received a name, a niche construction. That is the idea that something that an organism does external to itself uh, actually plays a significant role in its own evolution, uh, a kind of uh, as Doug Hofstetter would call a strange loop, so to speak. That is, uh, what we do to the world changes us. Uh, well, we're in a situation very similar to that now, where language clearly has played a role. Language has made technology possible. Um, I think that ever since language evolved, we have been, um, to some extent, linked together in a way that other species are not. Uh, that is, we cannot do what we do any longer without language. We cannot live without it. But language is something that's only, as Orth was hinting at uh, just a few minutes ago, is only transmitted collectively. It's not transmitted genetically, even though the predispositions are transmitted uh, genetically. Uh, and that means that we are, in effect, more dependent on that niche, the symbolic or linguistic or cultural niche, uh, than we would probably like to think. Uh, and as a result, the transition that we're beginning to face in which communication becomes a major driver uh, in the course of human history uh, is a similar sort of problem, a problem in which these capabilities are now exploding. And so it's turned my attention back to Teilhard and the idea of the noosphere. Okay, that's awesome. Now, uh, I want to provide a timeline for this. Teilhard uh, died in 1955, so he was actively thinking during the first half of the 20th century, mostly the 1930s and 40s. Much of his work was published posthumously. And it wasn't until the 1970s that the idea that, that, uh, that uh, organisms can evolve from groups as opposed to by small mutational steps from other organisms burst on the scene. I think there were some precursors to this, but it was the cell biologist Lynn Margulis who proposed that uh, eukaryotic cells, nucleated cells, evolved not by small mutational steps from bacteria, but as symbiotic associations of bacteria, the symbiotic cell theory, uh, so that uh, uh, units such as organelles, such as mit mitochondria and chloroplasts, actually were free living organisms um, in the distant past. And so the key idea here is that, is that groups can evolve to become so cooperative that they become super organisms, higher level organisms in their own right. So that was the 1970s. And it wasn't until the 1990s, so very recently by my lights, that um, uh, that uh, this idea was generalized by uh, John Maynard Smith and, and, uh, and us uh, in two books on the major evolutionary transitions. Bear in mind that in the 1970s, when Margulis proposed her ideas, group selection, a theory that's really needed to explain major transitions, was in its dark age. It was rejected by most evolutionary biologists at that, um, at that uh, time. And so in the 1990s now is the first time that this concept became generalized. And, and those books ended with some speculation about human language as a major transition. And then Terry's book, The Symbolic Species, brings us up to 1999, if I remember correctly, Terry. And, um, you know, we're at the dawn of the 21st century. And 
now we have this idea that goes moving forward from, of course, we have to talk about human origins and we need to talk about the whole nature of symbolic thought. And then back to Teilhard, I mean, the whole concept of the noosphere is this mental dimension to human society. And so now in the turn of the 21st century, we're only really gaining the capacity within evolutionary science to, uh, to do that. And now we're running it forward to the internet age and then beyond to the future. And the idea that this is, can be extrapolated to some kind of global cooperation or not, and in this moment of our history, that or not is looming dangerously uh, uh, close. Uh, there's utopic outcomes, global cooperation, uh, global brain and all that good stuff. And then there's dystopic alternatives, the collapse of civilization or or, or sinking into some deeply global despotic society that's good for a few elites and bad for everyone else. These are possibilities that we have to consider. But in any case, there can be no more important topic than this. And the concept of major transitions is, um, is the anchor concept, basically, that somehow this is a single concept that can run everything from the origin of life to the future of the internet age, which of course is what our series is all about. So how to begin? Um, I think maybe if uh, either one of you can uh, talk a little bit about uh, Lynn Margulis and her symbiotic cell theory, and then I'd like to move to the very beginning, to the origin of life, and then kind of take the, the grand arc of history from the origin of life to various levels of biological organization to humans to cultural evolution and up extrapolating into the future. So, but let's begin with Lynn Margulis, who, who I think is this pivotal figure, and then move to the, and then define the concept of major transitions in that context, the symbiotic cell theory, and then move to the origin of life. So, uh, Earth, would you like to begin? And then, and then, uh, and then uh, Pastor Terry? Gladly. Um, I appreciate the work of Lynn Margulis greatly. There is one thing, though, that I have to mention just uh, uh, for historical reasons that's a little bit similar to what uh, Copernicus did. I mean, also in ancient Greece, there was a heliocentric view of the world from Aristarchus, and uh, Copernicus actually knew about that. Uh, by the same token, uh, Lynn Margulis knew that uh, there were cell biologist in the distant past, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 10th, 20th century, for example, the Russian Mereshkovsky, who very clearly uh, indicated that uh, it's a possibility that certain of the cell organelles, little organs within a complex cell, you know, we are also built of complex cells and an amoeba is a complex cell, a paramecium is a complex cell. Bacteria are very, simple relative to that. Now, so the idea that came out of this was something that uh, a bigger cell can ingest a, 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 a bacterium-like creature and uh, uh, have a bout of major indigestion, uh, meaning that, you know, the, the, this uh, bacterium that was ingested was not digested. Instead, it was hanging around, so to speak, in the inside of the host cell. And this uh, bacterium, and I'm going to give examples what they could have been doing, this bacterium this time got integrated uh, to this uh, larger cell to such an extent that now neither of the original partners can reproduce uh, uh, alone. This is a very important thing to actually uh, come to a major transition where, where you have a point of no return, right? Now you have you have, now you have formed a higher level unit out of the lower level unit, and the two examples that have been confirmed extremely well, and I think nowadays everybody accepts it, partly because of the molecular and cell biological data, is that the, this little power plant in the in the cell that produces energy for our cells, called the mitochondria, 
once upon a time they were free, free living bacteria and also the plastids for example the green plastids that give the color to to, to our uh, common plants and uh, uh, who do the photosynthesis for the plant they were also free living cells cyanobacteria or blue green algae that's blue green algae is the traditional name for them so for them this coming together and living happily ever after you know that's that was the canonical scenario uh, that uh, has been accepted there were some other ideas uh, by lin margulis but also by others lin margulis was uh, was proposing that the, that uh, you know certain motility organs cilia and flagella for for the complex cells came from bacteria the spirochetes uh, or the idea by by tom cavalier smith that the so-called peroxisome which does something which is also important for the cell uh, uh, came also from an ingested bacterium but they have not been confirmed by evidence since but it's very important for, that for the plastids and the mitochondria this is now accepted by everybody and it's interesting that for the for the plastids this kind of transition transition happened a number of times repeatedly in the sense that uh, once you had a complex cell that it had this, this plastid inside which was turned into uh, the, the bacterium inside that was turned into a plastid so now this complex cell with the plastid inside uh, was swallowed by an even bigger cell so the the photosynthetic organ of the secondary symbiosis is now the result is, is is coming from the primary symbiosis so inside the big cell you 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 find a smaller but still very big cell and inside the inside the inside the not so big cell you still find the uh, the 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 descendant of the cyanobacterium doing the photosynthesis for you and that can, um, there are even tertiary symbiosis like you know these russian dolls you know that you, you put one doll into another this is exactly what was happening in the case of photosynthesis it's actually a great conundrum i don't understand it why this has never happened for respiration uh, i mean for, for the mitochondria it could have happened but it didn't as far as we know of course, lack of evidence is not an evidence of lack, but simply the statement holds that we don't know any secondary origin of the mitochondrion, let alone the tertiary one. So uh, the last thing I want to, to, to note here is very important. It is, as uh, David so kindly emphasized, I mean, this is a, a transition uh, which cannot be understood, unlike some others, by the idea of kin selection i mean the the being relatedness uh, playing a very important role because the plastids and 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 the host cell and the and the and the mitochondrion in a plant cell you have all three i mean those are all unrelated so i mean there is no way that a mitochondrion could could do the reproduction for the plastid as it were right or vice versa, because one is a pest, the other one is a mitoc. So what you need is a group selection procedure. You are selecting uh, basically on the, on, the, on, the, on the boat. I mean, they are all sitting in the same boat, but the, but the partners that came together, you know, initially had nothing to do with each other. And that's an important thing, you know? It's really the, what we are considering after the transition is the reproduction of the group which can actually form progenies and you can have lineages, genealogies and so on. And I think this is a very important thing. That is what I wanted to say. Yeah, and the group is um, and the group the group is uh, is a community. It's a, it's selection among alternative multi species communities, basically. And that idea, you know, seems radical, but now in the age of microbiomes, <laughs> it's just like the idea of whole ecosystems being selected, including some kind of co-evolution between our genes and our microbiomes. That's another story, but I think it shows you how important these ideas are. And the idea that the selection among units 
goes way beyond kin selection. These units that are being selected are going to be multi-species communities, large and small. They're going to be symbolic systems. They're going to be, so that's part of the generalization. Maybe I, I just one little note because uh, you and uh, even the audience might enjoy this, that uh, uh, it's actually, I mean, one of the triggers for this major transition thing was, I think my, my 87 paper in general theoretical biology, and it had the title Group Selection of Early Replicators and the Origin of Life. And uh, John Maynard Smith was the handling editor. And he said, oh, well, that, 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 that must be right. <laughs> yeah. so, that's, so I, I think that, that this idea also uh, uh, gave rise to kind of a major transition in thinking about those those things so so it goes i think it goes back to that in our um, joint genealogy with john yeah and up until that point john maynard smith was one of the main opponents of group selection but this now really changed his mind at least for the case of major transitions terry why don't you take it from here and segue us to the origin of life while you're at it so what i wanted to do is to go back to the 1970s again in the time that lynn margulis was writing uh, and one of her ideas was, of course, um, an idea antagonistic to the idea that evolution is all a competitive process and that she was very much more focused on cooperation among different species, among different levels. And so her approach to what she called endosymbiosis, that is symbiosis within an organism, within a cell, for example, that we've been talking about, uh, was part of a larger view that she had of evolution that was much more cooperative, that, m that much more involved sort of groups interacting with each other. Um, as a result, it was easy for her to sort of begin to reframe many of these, um, what we might call the complexities of cells and the complexities of bodies as cooperative relationships. Uh, group selection, of course, is about the evolution of cooperative relationships uh, from previous components that were not previously cooperating. Uh, there was another um, uh, revolution uh, now in genetics that begins in 1970. And that's the work having to do in genetics with gene duplication. And I wanted to put these in con in conversation with each other because uh, when uh, uh, Japanese researcher Ono be began to recognize that maybe the evolution of larger and larger genomes was the result of genes being duplicated and possibly cooperating with each other after duplication, being eliminated, being multiplied, and so on. Uh, it also changed our thinking about evolution to um, involve uh, cooperation in another sense. And I'm going to sort of shift some of my conversation in this direction, uh, because what's going on under those circumstances is that the, the surplus capacity uh, that he recognized was possible when you have gene duplication means that things can take on um, uh, cooperative roles with respect to each other. And one of the things that we've learned about many gene families is that when a gene is duplicated, particularly many, multiple times, uh, it becomes possible in some cases for subfunctionalization to develop. That is for cooperation to develop within the system because of multiplication. Uh, and I thought one of the one of the things that was very exciting, I think, about the shift that John uh, and Orsh were making was also a focus that has been uh, brought up in, by a man named James Griesemer, um, which is the idea of multiplication. That one of the things about life is that it multiplies. It makes more than it needs. Uh, and this is one of the things that makes natural selection possible, of course, uh, because if you have more variants than you need, in effect, more than need to be passed on, uh, selection is possible. Well, the same thing is happening within cells, um, within genomes, uh, at all kinds of levels. And multiplication, I think, is a part of the story that is oftentimes underplayed. Uh, but I think that it's also a, a major part of this story. Uh, but in any case, uh, this links to the situation we're talking about now, because one of the things that's happened is that all the devices that we've created and language itself um, allows multiplication in the sense that there can now be many people with the same capacity. 
people uh, with devices that do what we need and are a kind of surplus. Uh, the result of this, however, is that um, differentiation of functions can evolve. And I think one of the things that's, that's happened in, in human societies is because of this capacity to share information com by communication, uh, to uh, provide uh, devices that aid us, to help us to do things that we couldn't have done before, also plays a role in simplifying uh, some of the parts. And one of the things I think that's interesting about some of the more complex social organisms like you social insects is that there's been a simplification, not just a differentiation, uh, that some individuals don't do much. They do one task, uh, very much like what happens in human societies. And so uh, this brings me back to the, the great worry about the noosphere. Uh, one of the great worries about the noosphere is a dystopian future, one in which we are much more like social insects, uh, in which uh, individuals uh, lose autonomy, lose capacity, uh, and cede it to the larger social group. Uh, and so one of, the, one of the interests that we have is trying to understand how evolution can persist uh, in our own situation and can move towards sort of a higher order group organization in which that kind of a degradation uh, is not what occurs. I think we as individuals would find that pretty frightening. Yeah, let me um, um, affirm that and reinforce it, um, uh, Terry. A really hard thing to do, I think, uh, is to recognize both the presence and absence of functional organization at any given scale. On the one hand, it is a possibility that, that uh, a unit can become so cooperative that it qualifies in every sense of the word as an organism or a superorganism, or not. An alternative possibility is basically a Hobbesian war of all against all. Both exist, and we need to be able to identify what's happening, and of course, in any kind of policy sense, to um, to achieve cooperation. Um, but then, of course, there's different forms of cooperation, and there's forms of cooperation not worth wanting, is I think one of the things that you just said, that if it removes agency from the lower level units, and we simply become like skin cells that are that are could be shedded um, and individuals become disposable, then that's a horrifying uh, possibility. So uh, this is like, you know, threading a needle, the kind of uh, cooperation worth wanting and expanding it to the global scale is, uh, it is there's no inevitability about it. Uh, and Teilhard did not imply that there was, although he's often taken to, to um, uh, to mean that, but this is this should be very suspenseful for all of us. How is it that we can achieve a global cooperation worth wanting? Is what uh, is what we need to uh, what we need to achieve and see clearly and work towards it. Okay, so uh, Terry, bring us to the origin of life. How do we take this concept, which started with the symbiotic cell theory, bacteria to nucleated cells? How does it apply to that question of question, the origin of life. The origins of life question, of course, is about how we go from chemistry to what I like to call normative chemistry, in which there's some good chemistry and bad chemistry. And that means you have to have a system uh, that in effect um, uh, supports itself. Uh, and there have been many, many approaches to this. Uh, the current um, favorite, I think, in the community is uh, an RNA world theory. Uh, and this was the result of the discovery, uh, now decades past, that, that RNA molecules can both function as catalysts and as information-like molecules, as templates of a form. Um, there are many alternatives, and um, uh, Orsh is, of course, uh, very much involved in this as well. Um, I happen to be less attracted to the RNA world approach, uh, in part because of my interest in the concepts of information and reference. Uh, and that's because mere replication uh, is not about anything uh, in some sense. And so I've been very much focused on how it is that a molecule can come to have, uh, can come to be about something else, how a molecule can come to trans 
transition to the point of being not just about uh, other copies of itself, not just about including copies, but how a molecule can come to be the uh, molecule that regulates the relationships between other molecules. Uh, that, I think, is a much more complex problem, uh, one that I think we have not well addressed yet in the field. But as a result, there are many sort of alternatives to, to this. One is whether uh, metabolism comes first, whether information molecules come first, whether enclosure comes first. Um, I actually um, favor something more general, which is that I think this sort of aboutness comes first. But that's, again, my focus on uh, on language-like and semiotic forms of communication. But the, the important point about this transition um, is that it's a transition um, into something very, very different. The second law of thermodynamics is suddenly being used against itself to produce both order and to maintain uh, existing constraints, existing systems. So um, it's a transition that is a major transition, but maybe the major transition. Uh, in the sense that um, it changes the physics of the world in a sort of radical way. I think the excitement about the origins of life question is that it had to be very simple. It had to involve a spontaneous processes, and yet it had to um, undermine uh, one of the most basic features about the universe, the second law of thermodynamics, by finding a way in a sort of circuitous way to use the second law against itself. This makes it a really remarkable transition, a transition that I think is behind all of the transitions. Yeah, that's uh, incredible and um, a great way to um, a great way to start. When you say normative chemistry, that's so evocative because normative, of course, implies morals, which we associate with humans. And now you're associating it with basically the origin of uh, life and with semiotics and so on. So Basically, this takes very deep philosophical questions and puts them right in the beginning. And also, um, we have an opportunity here uh, in this conversation, in addition to providing an overview, uh, we have two of the, you know, the deepest thinkers on this topic to discuss with each other. And of course, this is very nascent science. It's not at all settled. And so we have some differences of, of opinion here, perhaps, that we can, that we can um, move on to center stage at the same time that we're providing a very broad canvas for our for our listeners. So uh, us, uh, um, over to you on the um, on the origin of life. Well, um, uh, there is one thing I have to say first that uh, I had a very prominent mentor uh, and he was giving lectures uh, at the what is was called the free university in Hungary. It turns out that actually it was uh, better in a way than the university itself because at the university, all kinds of people were lecturing. At the free university, only the best ones were lecturing. So, uh, And he was Tibor Ganti, originally a, a chemical engineer, who ever since he was a, a secondary school student himself, he was interested in the question, okay, what would be the chemical uh, foundations of life and how this could shed light on the origin of life? So... In in uh, in seventy one, he published a book in Hungarian, which had the title "The Principle of Life," and uh, uh, there he had uh, two systems, two chemical systems linked together. One was what resembles a, a, a DNA-like molecule, uh, in which you can have what we call replication. So it's a it's a molecule that you can extend like this, you know, it's like a thread. And then you can basically copy digit by digit, okay, so to speak, by, by, by building block by building block, okay? That's, that's, the, that's the template replication, as we call it. Um, and the other system that he had was a system of, for metabolism. Uh, but the important thing is that the metabolic system was also growing, okay? So because if you can take a template, you know, and then you copy it, then you will have, you know, exponential growth. Now he realized that you also have to do it for the metabolic system. And the chemists in general call this tendency for growth autocatalysis. Now catalysis is something where there is a molecule and it helps the transition uh, of 
another molecule X into becoming molecule Y. Now, autocatalysis is a process whereby the Y equals, equals the, the catalyst itself. So what it means that you start with one molecule of catalyst and the expense of consuming uh, material X, now you have two copies of, 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 of the catalyst itself. It doesn't have to be a big molecule. Uh, actually, the first uh, reaction of this, uh, very relevant still for the origin of life, was discovered by a, a, a Russian chemist called Butlerov in the 1860-something. So quite before the Miller experiments, I have to say. And it was a very simple reaction. He realized that if he takes a, a solution of formaldehyde, and uh, which, is, which, has a, which is a very simple molecule, it's one carbon atom in it and some others, two, two uh, atoms of hydrogen and one, mole one atom of oxygen, that's formaldehyde. So, and there is also some, some glycolaldehyde in it, which is uh, two formaldehyde molecules linked together. Then sugars, sugar molecules are spontaneously, spontaneously appearing in the solution. And then it was discovered that actually they are accumulating exponentially. So what, what the heck is going on? That is that this molecule of glycolaldehyde can eat up another molecule of formaldehyde, then another molecule of formaldehyde, and then it spontaneously splits into two molecules of glycolaldehyde. So that is a real autocatalyst for you. And because it produces sugar molecules, it's also relevant for the origin of life and it's also spontaneous. So Gandhi in the early 70s realized that if you want to build a biological minimal system out of qualitatively different chemical systems, then for the metabolic system, uh, you also must have something which grows, which has its own growth. And then in 74, he realized that, okay, you have to put them into a bag because otherwise the constituents will flow away. Uh, and then he realized that that bag also has to grow and it has to be autocatalytic in that sense. And it's actually true because now we know for sure, uh, uh, I mean, uh, ever since the Signer Nikolson model in 72, so that the, the little building blocks that gives you the, the bag they can spontaneously in, be inserted into the bag and they can grow. And if you put all the three components together, it will also grow in space, which means it will, have, will undergo spontaneous division. And what we want to, say, want, we want to see, how these systems can now be realized in the lab in chemistry, because that will give us a hint how this could have happened uh, uh, roughly four billion years ago in the Earth. David. Yeah, I just want to reinforce that uh, that uh, just about every scenario requires units of selection, basically. These things must exist in numbers. There must be a population of them. Some must work better than others. There must be differential replication. There's no way to tell the story without units of selection, vesicles or so on, little protocells. And then, of course, there's there's many different ways that that might happen. And so uh, uh, maybe a little bit more from both of you on that. What were those first proto cells? Were they lipid vesicles? Were they clay particles? Were they, um, what are some of the, what are the, some of the scenarios for these first proto cells, these first, you know, they're the first units of selection? First of all, we, we could spend the entire uh, session talking about the various theories. Um, and I, I, I'd rather not sort of go too far into that. Um, my own view uh, is that uh, we've been too driven by what we know about living cells, what we know about living systems. And, and we've ignored one thing that I think is very important, that um, there's an area of life that is itself on this boundary. Uh, we don't think about it as such, but it's viruses. Uh, viruses, um, we think about them as just simply these days, maybe chemical fragments of life, something that's broken off. Um, I myself think about uh, the fact that viruses are only secondarily uh, parasitic. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time trying to understand what it would be like for there to be a, uh, in a sense, an autogenic, self-reproducing virus. 
uh, what would be the minimal possibility there? Uh, and this has led me um, to go back to a number of researches that goes all the way back to Miller and Urey. Uh, in which they were able to generate um, by bringing together molecules that were thought to be sort of in a primitive planetary system like the Earth before oxygen and so on uh, before life and show that, that, that you could, in fact, generate uh, amino acids, building blocks of proteins. Uh, a number of people who worked associated with that work recognized that there was something else that was generated in the flask during this period of time, and it was mostly in the form of a sludge, uh, a kind of a uh, gooey, molasses-like substance, very dark uh, and very sticky. And it turned out to be a complex of uh, hydrogen cyanide polymers. Uh, long strings of hydrogen cyanide that, that basically uh, HCN that links together uh, to produce a backbone that's very much like the backbone of a protein, that is carbon nitrogen backbone, with side chains on it. Uh, and uh, a group of researchers following up on this began to realize that if you take these molecules and you dissolve them in water, and they don't dissolve well because, in effect, they fold up on each other and they're like, again, like molasses and only thicker, uh, kind of a tar, um, that eventually they break off and the components, as a result, are uh, amino acid-like components. Uh, so one of the arguments is that that maybe one of the original stories has to do with protein-like molecules, but, but maybe not protein, something that's more like a hydrogen cyanide polymer. The interesting thing about them is that they're large uh, and, and they have complex surface structure. Uh, they can play multiple roles, including roles like proteins do, uh, as catalysts. Uh, and so it became one of my focus to look at this uh, in part to recognize that hydrogen cyanide polymers are also very, very um, easily produced in the outer solar system in areas where there is not liquid water, uh, that they are showing up on comets in large numbers, and that in fact they may be one of the things that rain down uh, early on in the bombardment phase of our solar system, that maybe some of the components of life, and I think the original component, my own, uh, this is a bias in this whole process, but but I think that, that one can do this instead of having a cell membrane, uh, actually uh, a structure like a virus capsule uh, that is in fact holding a content, uh, but is capable of being interrupted and broken open and so on. So I see viruses as a kind of after the fact model for a transition between what we would call living today, something that metabolizes and does all, of, all the things that we see even bacteria do. Um, that is not quite life, uh, so that we have this sort of middle range. Now, what's interesting in this is that um, we have not gone back to something really, really simple. And, and I think one of the real challenges for the origins of life story has to do with this simplicity problem. How can it be quite simple and do the kinds of things that are necessary to get a selection process started? Uh, and that has to do with reproduction, of course. Um, but it also has to do with units. Something has to be a unit. And I think you bring this up as you talk about units of selection. It has to produce a sort of a, an individual. And that individual needs to have the ability to repair and reproduce itself. Well, we have a lot of ground to cover, but still, I want to give us a chance to uh, to have uh, his say on the origin of life, and then we're going to proceed to multicellularity and beyond. So, so uh, back to you. There are several angles from which one can uh, respond to to to, to Terry. Uh, I, I would like to take a rather neutral. Uh, ground here and emphasize a few things. Uh, one is that um, I fully agree that uh, you possibly didn't start with what I call the, the holy trinity of Gandhi, right? The compartment, the, you know, the template replication uh, and the metabolism together. So I introduced the term infrabiological systems uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, where I said, okay, uh, if you just make combinations of two different systems, uh, for example, you have a, something like a compartment and the metabolism inside, inside, then you already, you already have something which is already 
going very much in the direction of biology, but arguably it's not living yet. So first thing I want to say is that right now in the experimental world of, of uh, this branch of chemistry, what people are trying to do is exactly these infrabiological systems combination of two that would spontaneously cooperate together and uh, do something which is sustainable. The second, uh, second uh, remark I wish to make is that uh, this idea, of course, does not constrain, uh, you know, uh, ab initio, so to speak, the chemical nature, the chemical rendering, you know, of the necessary coupling. So let's not be too, too dogmatic about it. Although I believe that there was a phase when RNA was very important, uh, but it's too complicated to begin with. I mean, I, I, if, if somebody is honest immediately, it sees it from the literature, there must have been something, as Terry said, something which goes in the right direction, but it's uh, significantly simpler than RNA, but it has to be able to store some chemical information. And this chemical information acquires its meaning because it can do some function which is useful, you know, the system as a whole. So the, the system as a whole is a Kantian whole, as it were, because the different uh, parts of the system get their meaning only in the light of the other system, other subsystems, and they have to, they have to, uh, they have to uh, uh, give uh, their own, I mean, the, the conditions for existence mutually for each other. But as I say, the chemical experimentation, the real experimentation within this theoretical domain, it's rather free and it may not even be carbon based. I mean, that's something for the future. Uh, chemistry is not developed enough to answer this question conclusively. And the third one I wish to say is about the units of uh, selection problem here. Um, there are basically three types that you can explore and also experimentally it needs to be explored. One is when the molecules are on a surface, right? So it's not, you know, that they are freely moving around in three dimensions. The surface already gives you a very nice population structure and there have been beautiful models of it, as you know, <laughs> that's, that's the first thing. The second thing, I give you the word, but I want to finish. The second thing is where you have transient formation of groups, right? So there is local interactions, you get washed away, you get mixed, and then you again make the local interactions. And the third one is when you are sitting in the same pot and you are reproducing, right? So these are, these are options that probably all of them happen, by the way, right? That's important, I think. So what I want to do is to actually show how this moves us forward, uh, these discussions, because everything we talked about this transition to what I call normative chemistry, and I don't mean I don't mean this term in terms of just morals, but you know, good chemistry versus bad chemistry, helpful chemistry versus not helpful, helpful functional chemistry versus neutral chemistry. There's no such thing outside of life that has any of those normative characters. Uh, but notice that in everything we've said, and this doesn't matter whose theory it is, um, it's cooperative. That is, there needs to be. Um, components that do complementary features that and in a sense the Kant, the story from Kant is that each component is both um, uh, cause and effect of the other components uh, that was his way of talking about it now I, I think that uh, his way was maybe a little too simple it's not just of course uh, reciprocal ca catalysis it's not where catalysts produce each other, it's got to be more than that. And I think one of the challenges is figuring out what's the simplest cooperation to get started. But the, le the, the question that we're after is that um, how you get those cooperations? How does cooperation happen spontaneously so that when it does occur, when a, a, a new level of group cooperation occurs, uh, how does it stay together? How does it keep itself repaired? How does it prevent um, a lower order processes from taking it apart, from breaking it down and so on and so forth? The challenge has always from the origins of life been the challenge of putting things together to cooperate, so to speak, uh, to support each other's existence and therefore to support the existence 
of that whole cooperative unit. Um, when there are so many forces in the world that tend to break those things down. That's uh, beautiful, Terry. Thank you for saying that. Russ, okay, but then I warn you, we're moving on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to add something uh, which uh, highlights, you know, why it is an important problem and why it is a difficult problem. Uh, so I used to say that the problem of the origin of life is a sufficient degree of metabolite channeling without evolved enzymes. Now, uh, the, uh, let me illustrate this point by the following. Uh, there was a meeting when, you know, Stanley Miller was presenting his uh, results. And then there was another important guy in the audience and he said, I mean, these experiments are amazing, one by one, but only one by one. Because if you put them together, nothing interesting happens. Right. So that's exactly the point that you have to find these different uh, components that can synergistically uh, help each other cooperate without uh, destroying each other. And that is, in a rudimentary system is not trivial. OK, now um, we're trying to get to human origins. <laughs> But uh, we have to go by way of multicellular organisms and social insect colonies, ultrasocial uh, insect and other uh, colonies. And with multicellularity, it seems simple at first because you have a single cell, let us say a nucleated cell, it begins to divide. Uh, they're genetically identical to each other except for the odd mutation. So what's hard to understand? But of course, there's so much more that needs to be understood with respect to multi cellularity, those mutations do accumulate. We call that cancer. And also, there's just the most fascinating comparison between the internet, which we're getting to, and the nervous system, which is a, a system of electronic communication coordinating millions and even billions of cells. And so I'm just dying to hear from both of you on, let's begin with multicellularity. And anything that you can do to relate to to why this is uh, was not a simple transition, uh, but has its, its own challenges and complexity, basically maintaining cooperation, as Terry just, just said. The fact that the cells are genetically very similar to each other does not entirely solve the problem. And then this idea of the nervous system as the first internet. Uh, this is an interesting question, David, you know, whether it's uh, simple or not, because uh... Some people think that it's so simple that uh, one, one of them had the, the title of a painter, a minor major transition. And that was the origin of multicellularity. Uh, well, it, it depends. So uh, it's, it's, it, I think it's easier than some other transitions. Uh, and the hint is that it happened uh, really over 20 times in evolution and even it happened even in bacteria bacteria can become also multicellular and uh, uh, strangely enough uh, one of, some of them have this uh, what i call aggregational multicellularity which means that cells are coming together you know they do something they form a fruiting body it looks like a mushroom and then they reproduce but not everybody reproduces so they even have a, a, a reproductive division of labor and the same kind of lifestyle also happens with complex cells, with the slime molds, right? So that, that's a beautiful example of convergent evolution, for starting from very different directions. Um, but if you look at the very complex multicell organisms, then that happened only three times in evolution. It's plants, animals, and fungi. And... Uh, uh, again, there are differences how easy it is to make. I mean, for for plant-like multicellularity or, or mushroom-like multicellularity, it's very simple because, uh, because the individual cells, you know, they, 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 they divide, they stick together, and which is important, they are not moving around relative to, it, to each other because of the, the cell walls, you know, uh, stick together and that's it. So it's a fairly rigid geometric structure and it's very simple. Actually, this sticking together uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a rigid way 
is one of the reasons why cancer is not a big problem for mushrooms and plants because they cannot form metastasis. You know, they, uh, there, is, there is local tumor growth in plants, but they cannot go move around like crazy, like what, which happens in animals. Now, the origin of, of, of uh, multicellularity in animals, I think, is a much more complicated question. Uh, just look at the just, just look at development by itself, right? The development of the cnidarian, right? It's it's not that just uh, they are dividing and they stick together. There, there's all kinds of this this mechanical gymnastics. It, it I must say, it boggles the mind. No engineer would have designed it that way, right? Because it looks so complicated. And nevertheless, you know, it turned out to be a highly successful thing. The important thing is, is that's not only the, the, the cells that can move around and crawl on top of each other and what, whatever, but it is very important that animals as complete organizations are moving around. So I would agree with the late Louis Wolpert, who died just, you know, uh, last year, actually almost exactly a year ago, uh, that the, the, the main and primary function of the nervous system is motor control, right? It's the control of movement. And everything is a secondary consequence of that. Uh, and uh, I think that leads seamlessly into what Terry wants to say. Yeah, and so on our way, we should point out that, uh, that uh, fungi, of course, with their hyphal masses, have amazing communication systems, which are sometimes electronically uh, mediated. So hyphal growth and uh, being coordinated and this wonderful, wonderful stuff there. And, and even the concept of whole forests being symbiotic associations, which might or might not be true, but, uh, but I guess give this sense of possibility that there's all kinds of amazing coordination that's possible, including interspecific coordination and trust-specific uh, coordination without nervous systems. Um, so, uh, Arsh, do you want to comment on that? And then we'll pass to Terry. Actually, uh, uh, learning information acquisition from experience does not necessarily require a system. It needs an operational principle that is similar to parts of the nervous system, but the instantiation can be a different one. In fact, it has been proven that whatever a nervous system can do, in principle, you could do it, the same functionality you could do with a carefully designed chemical network, right? The, but the realization is completely different, of course. Yep. No, that's very important to make. Very, very, very important. Uh, so, um, so uh, Terry, now, but uh, nevertheless, let's talk about the nervous system as the first internet, or one of the first internets. I want to go back, first of all, to some place that or sort of mentioned and work my way up. Uh, and that is um, this... Uh, which I think was first synthesized, although people had various thought of this, a man named um, Leo Buss uh, in the early 1980s, uh, made the argument that the, the three major groups that Orsch mentioned, plants, animals, and fungi, had different tricks in order to keep themselves from regressing back to autonomous cells taking over and causing trouble, uh, and that there were three different kinds of tricks uh, and I think it helps us explain part of this problem. This is a kind of a ratchet effect, you know, how, how to burn the bridge so you can't go back, uh, so to speak. And for fungi, and you've been mentioning this just a few minutes ago, and that is that uh, they have a tremendous amount of difficulty retaining communication within a cell. So that cells have lost some autonomy and there's a lot of information that sort of spills out collectively and so that neighboring cells are in constant communication and to some extent even the nuclei can move around the system uh, and so it, one of the problems with this is that you don't have an easy way to differentiate tissues. It takes a very complicated system to differentiate tissues. And so when you cut into a mushroom, for example, all the tissues look a little bit different, but basically the cell types are almost identical. Um, so one of the problems of having complete communication like that, you know, complete loss of individuation of the cells, um, is that it's difficult to differentiate. Um, on the other hand, plants, um, 
uh, I've accomplished this process of keeping the system from falling apart by sort of locking everybody in place. And Orsha is sort of mentioning this, that if you have a, a, a cell wall, um, it means that you can't determine that you're going to be the reproductive cell. Uh, because wherever you are, you're stuck. And whoever's the last cell to be you know, generated at the end of an apical meristem, they're the ones that might have a shot um, at passing on their gene. So that to some extent, um, plants accomplish this ratchet effect uh, by blocking the ability for any uh, component to see ahead. Animals, it turns out, tend to block this ability by having the earliest stages of differentiation effectively controlled by the maternal source. Uh, by basically having the first few steps of, of differentiation not controlled by the local genome, but controlled by sort of a parent and ancestral genome. Uh, that locks everybody into a particular fate early on. Locks everybody by this, I mean different cells. Now, what's interesting about this is this leads back to um, a philosopher named John Rawls who argued that to, to build the just society, there need to be a kind of veil of ignorance. So you couldn't know when you come into society whether or not you're going to be able to have lots of money, lots of influence, and so on. This is effectively biology coming up with a John Rawls solution for multicellularity uh, in three different ways. Now, the reason I mentioned these three different ways is there are, of course, possibilities for our own future, our own John Rawls future, so to speak, in the human biology. But Having said that, I want to now sort of move towards animals. And I think Orsh introduced this pretty well. And the real challenge is when you have cells that can move around, now you can use position uh, to determine uh, what you do and don't do. So that as the early an animal embryo develops, uh, what happens is cells come into position with respect to each other. And their relative positions help them communicate to each other and say, you're over here, I'm over there, you're going to become that kind of cell, I'm going to become this kind of cell. And so the three-dimensional changes in shape as an organism, as an animal develops, a multi-celled animal, um, uses shape position information to turn on and off genes. Uh, and as a result, um, it adds something else to it a much more Darwinian-like logic for development. Uh, and that means that we have uh, one of the things that makes particularly animal multicellularity so interesting is that as a result, programmed cell death plays a very significant role as well. That is that some cells uh, turn themselves off because they're in a particular position where a signal comes and says, okay, um, you're not needed anymore. Uh, now, what's remarkable and relevant in this process is that this basically says that individual cells have given up autonomy. Not only have they given up autonomy to be reproductive cells, uh, but they've given up autonomy sometimes even to persist for the good of the whole, so to speak. Um, this is something pretty radical that animals, animal bodies have produced. Well, it turns out that the animal nervous system uses this same logic, um, but it now uses it in sort of a doubled form. That is the position of cells, where they find themselves in the early developing embryo, determines what kind of cell they're going to be. But then they begin to send out these long feelers. Instead of just chemical communication to the neighboring cells, these long branches called axons that actually sort of um, probe their way through the nervous system to find a target. When they make that target, um, they begin to send signals. But those signals now um, act like the local topographic signals that we saw in a developing body. But now they're action at a distance because a cell in one part of the nervous system can affect what a cell does in another part of the nervous system. And some of those cells also die. Some of those connections, which are overproduced in the sense that multiplication again, um, Many of them are eliminated because they are not coordinated in firing with each other. Uh, and so we have this sort of standard statement that we tell all our students about the developing nervous system that, that axons that fire together wire together, which means that those that don't, that are not, in a sense, coordinated in their activity, in a sense, don't reinforce each other. Another kind of group effect or cooperative effect. Terry, another Darwinian process, right? So we have basically Darwinian processes spotting other Darwinian processes. So this is what we mean by neural Darwinism, right? That's right. And yet, 
there are some really critical differences. One of them is, of course, it is not recursive. Uh, you don't develop them, call them, develop more, call them, develop more. It's a single cycle Darwinian process, so to speak. Uh, and that's the same with developing multicellularity. Um, it's also a single process. But um, to end this story, and, and this is where Ursh and I have exactly said the same thing. Nervous systems uh, show up in motile creatures, creatures that are not rooted to the ground. We even find that animals that eventually get rooted to the ground, who maybe produce mobile uh, embryos, um, once they become rooted to the ground like a sponge or um, uh, uh, well, various, I, I won't go into the long list of them, but once they do so, they oftentimes lose their nervous system, sometimes eat their nervous system, so to speak, uh, because it's no longer necessary. But it's not just movement that's critical, because if you're going to move, you have to predict. You have to know something about what's ahead, what's behind, what's to the side. You have to have predictive organs. And so what we've also find about nervous systems is they develop typically on one end of a bilaterally symmetric creature that has a, a forward moving end and a, and a, and a propulsive end. Um, those that don't have that kind of organization, like jellyfish and so on, have a distributed nervous system that doesn't have a brain, so to speak. But if you're moving, you really need to have a leading edge and that leading edge needs to have predictive organs, like organs that sample chemicals, smell, taste, or organs that handle light frequencies, um, like eyes, like eye spots, and so on. Um, and that means that because the prediction is going to be mostly at one end, at the front end, you're going to have to accumulate many more cells at that predictive end of the body. And so brains always tend to develop towards the front end, towards the part that eats, towards the part that's going forward, towards the part that's anticipating. Um, and of course, what we see is as, as organisms get more and more complex, larger and larger, um, that front end of the nervous system gets bigger and more differentiated in the process. Okay, so uh, uh, Urs, uh, go ahead, and then I'm going to do a time check. So uh, Urs, do you want to take your turn with... Uh multicellularity in uh, animals? It's actually important to emphasize that uh, uh, in the nervous system, it's not always a, a, a one-shot game, right? I mean, it, for a while it looked like that, right? That you are producing, you know, many neurons, many connections, you eliminate what which is not belonging and that's it. It turns out to be not the case. Uh, there is this very interesting phenomenon which is called structural plasticity. Structural plasticity means that it's uh, not only the old-fashioned Hebbian uh, uh, synoptic plasticity where a synapse which already exists can become weaker or stronger, but actually uh, the, uh, there are new connections that are physically made in real time in, 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 in animals and you can even watch them now with sophisticated uh, uh, microscopy. So new connections are being made and old connections are being eliminated. So it's actually, it's recursive in that sense. And it can have many rounds of, uh, of production of variation and selection. And I think this is a very important uh, uh, process. And we are not fully aware, I believe, uh, of all the algorithmic consequences of that. That's a point one I wanted to make, but I think it's very important. The second thing is that there are other examples where evolution by natural selection has reinvented itself, so to speak. And that's the, that's the working of the adaptive immune system, you know, in our uh, branch of animals. Uh, actually t evolved twice, but uh, actually discovered very much the same principles, which means that you are actually producing a lot of variation, but uh, because uh, you have elevated mutation rates and you have got what is called somatic recombination. And this is how you can uh, generate the anti antibody diversity. And then uh, you 
are doing the selection on this emerging population, those antibodies that are gener- that are binding to the antigen very uh, efficiently are going to be selected. And now it happens painfully, you know, for us with the COVID, you can watch it in real time again. But it's very important that it has been discovered by evolution itself, how to how to harness an evolutionary system within itself. I think it's remarkable. Yeah, so this is the idea that uh, Darwinian evolution can be intragenerational in addition to intergenerational. And without getting into the neural mechanisms, much can be said about our behavioral system as like the immune system with both an adaptive and an innate component. So we have lots of psychological mechanisms that evolutionary psychologists like to talk about that that evolve by genetic evolution, they get triggered by environmental circumstances, don't change during the course of our lifetimes. And then there's the open-ended part of our behavioral systems, what V.F. Skinner calls selection by consequences, which is basically like the adaptive component of the immune system. And of course, it has a mechanistic basis. But even without that basis, we can make the observation that uh, the, the individual human and many other species have this ability, basically selection by consequences, they behave every which way, and those that are rewarded in various ways, then they are um, they are um, matched up in in frequency. That's the matching law, so to speak, even before we know what the mechanistic uh, basis is. Okay, so on to our next chapter: from multicellular organisms to societies of organisms that become so cooperative that they qualify as superorganisms. And the famous examples are the eusocial insects, the ants, the bees, the wasps, the termites, which were called superorganisms way back when uh, people like Wheeler in the early 20th century uh, said, these are superorganisms. Uh, they have their own complicated history, but I think uh, nowadays, I think they fall very naturally into the concept of major evolutionary transitions. And they're so interesting because uh, the members of these societies are obviously not physically connected. And nevertheless, by virtue of the ways that they coordinate, uh, cooperate, often through chemical signals, pheromones and all, all that, or of course, auditory and all the modalities, uh, they truly do qualify as superorganisms complete with group minds. And there's the most wonderful work by people like Tom Seeley, Honeybee Democracy, as to how uh, there is definitely a cognitive dimension a mental dimension to non-human, uh, ultra-cooperative societies. Uh, we have a whole episodes on this in the series, but so eager to hear what you have to say about this major transition, uh, non-human uh, uh, societies that are ultra-cooperative. Uh, uh, who'd like to begin? Obviously, uh, social insects, uh, you know, have been around, uh, you know, uh, and um, mankind always saw them and uh, they they were fascinated and they were puzzled by uh, their existence. Uh, one of the striking things was that uh, uh, in the real, I mean, in the highly evolved social insects, um, not everybody uh, is reproducing. And that was a conundrum. Uh, Darwin was puzzled by that. But since he was very smart, he figured out that maybe uh, the real unit here uh, that we have to focus on is not the individual, but the family, right? Without we could say it's a kin group, right? And if now different families are uh, competing with each other, then it might very well be the case that certain individuals by sacrificing uh, themselves in terms of the reproductive success would actually help the others that reproduce, it might actually pay off uh, because of the synergistic benefits that this reproductive division of labor uh, is giving. So that's the first thing that we we have to uh, be started by. The second thing is that something which is important for the organisms, uh, which we call epigenetic inheritance, uh, plays a, also a very important role in those uh, societies. Uh, we didn't explicitly mention it uh, uh, when we talked about differentiation in, in conventional organisms, uh, that um, it's not only the DNA, the genetic material that is being passed on from cell to cell, 
you know, for example, if a cell, if a liver cell this divides, it gives rise to to two liver cells. But you know, the liver cell, you know, developed during the, the development, there was no liver cell; there was only a zygote. So the liver cell, the lineage of cells that went into the direction of the of being a liver cell, acquired during development this state, the state of being a liver cell. But apparently, when it divides, it's also not only the, the genetic material, but this state of being a liver cell is also being passed on. And it turns out to be uh, the case that it, what is very important is that certain genes are on, which means that they are active. Other genes are off. This is how you can make uh, cells that have look different, that, that they work differently. But once you are able to pass this information on, okay, keep this gene on, keep this gene off. So once, once you can also transmit the switches, then you uh, solve a problem, what is called epigenetic, but it's also a form of inheritance. Now, this type of inheritance is also important for social insects, because whether you are becoming a, a queen or a worker, that, be, that depends on your diet, right? And that diet induces a certain epigenetic change, which meaning you are either going this way or that way, just like the, the, the determination of cell fate. You either go this way or that way, and that can also be induced by other cells in the neighboring tissue, for example. So that's the second important thing that uh, we have to face with. And the third one is that it's not only the reproductive division of labor that is important, but you actually have different kinds of workers also. For example, if you look at a beautiful illustration, for example, in the old book by Brehm on the animal world, you see these beautiful graphics that uh, looks into the inside of a termite mound. And there is the, uh, in the middle, there is a big sausage. Now that Sausage is the, the only reproductive individual, and there are all kinds of different uh, animals. They look as if they were coming from different species. Yes, but they are members of not only of the same species, but of the same colony. But, you know, there is a soldier which looks completely different from another guy who is the, the certain type of work. So it's not only the reproductive division of labor, but also this division of labor of the household that is uh, very active. And altogether, the whole uh, uh, unit uh, works very much like a, an integrity, integrated human city because they have to solve everything. They have to get rid of the dead, for example. You cannot accumulate the dead and because then you will be choked and you will get infections and so on. So uh, some people call it the wisdom of the hive. You know, in parallel with the wisdom of the body, and this is what ex exactly what has happened in evolution. The the hive got his wisdom at a level which is above the individual through evolution. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And just to build upon that um, um, a little bit, uh, the um, uh, the unit is not necessarily the family. Uh, there's so many social insect colonies in which uh, the relatedness is actually not that high. There's multiple queens, there's multiple patch lines, uh, and so on and um, uh, so on and so forth. And actually, the unit is a multi-species community because if you look at the termites and if you look at the leafcutter ants and and other um, uh, societies, there's all these symbionts that are in there. And so it comes down, and this is a general statement that we could be make about major evolutionary transition, these units of selection, they can be a single species, they can be a multi-species, um, uh, their members can be very highly related or not so much. There obviously has to be variation among units. I mean, there has to be that much variation, but there's so much diversity in what constitutes a unit of selection. And that's one reason why kin selection is incomplete basically, because it notes this one, one variable genetic relatedness among the members. But, um, um, and of course that, that has an impact, but uh, is not the one and only uh, thing. So, so I think that that's why um, the, um, the ultra-social species uh, slots so nicely into the major evolutionary transitions framework, basically, 
that's the way it originated. <laughs> They've been called superorganisms since antiquity. Let's continue to call them superorganisms. So um, anyhow, I uh, just wanted to put that in there. And so, uh, Terry, do you want to continue this uh, wonderful conversation? There's a couple of things that I wanted to sort of focus on because we've covered, I, I think, the, the overarching picture. Um, what I'm interested in is, is two things here. First of all, why it's different than a multi-celled organism. Obviously, social groups are not bounded, not physically bounded. Uh, their individuals, their components are able to move. That's a, a critical feature. Uh, the second thing is that like when we talked about uh, multicellularity of plants, fungi, and animals, um, there is a ratchet-like effect. It, you can't go back. Uh, in multicellularity, um, when there is an error made in turning genes off and turning genes on, um, you have a problem. It's called cancer. Um, cells that previously were dividing uh, uncontrollably as building a large organism, um, uh, at some point have to slow down or stop. So for example, for most neurons, when they reach what we call terminal differentiation, they'll never divide again. Muscle cells, they reach terminal differentiation, they don't divide again, um, unless there's an error, unless uh, the genes that are involved in replication come on again. So one of the things that has to happen in building multicellularity is you have to have these ratchet effects, something that keeps the system from going back. Um, in the case of social groups or social insects, uh, one of the things that you have to do is to um, ensure that the components not only maintain their function, but also don't recover some degree of autonomy. So one of the things that happens in um, the eusocial insects, uh, whether, whether we're dealing with those that are re closely related, like in bees and ants, or, or in fact, can, can sometimes be combinations like in termites and so on, and, and with a very different kind of inheritance system. Um, what, there has to what has to happen is something that keeps the system from regressing, keeps components that were um, differentiated to be, say, a worker or a, um, a, uh, a soldier or whatever um, from actually recovering or to keep um, workers from becoming queens. Uh, one of the things that happens, and this is very much like the differentiation that you mentioned before, uh, is that what happens is that hormones or pheromones of various kinds are used to create body types, to restructure the body, to restructure the nervous system in such a way that it cannot do the other things, that basically shuts off some of these uh, opportunities. Now, the question that I'm most interested when, it, when we talk about both multicellularity, but in particular also social, um, eusocial-like relationships, and I think this will also apply when we begin talking about human beings, um, is that one of the things that has to happen in order to give up autonomy, in order to move from autonomous life to non-autonomous life in which you're collectively working as a group, um, there have to be sort of benefits to giving this up. Uh, and in fact, there has to be a certain point that you become, I like to describe this as a kind of addiction. Um, ad addiction takes place when there's been enough of a change in the system so that giving up this dependence on something external to yourself um, is now too painful, too difficult. You can't go back. With respect to opiates, the nervous system has changed so radically by the infusion of opiates that to give it up uh, becomes painful. Uh, a whole bunch of systems react negatively. In effect, you've become stuck. You can't get out of the system. This is a ratchet-like effect. I think one of the challenges in explaining the origins of eusociality, but also the origins of multicellularity, and eventually I would I'd make the claim the origins of uh, human so sociality and language in particular, um, is that there has to be kind of an addiction process that takes place. That is, one of the things that has to happen is that um, in order to give up the tendency to become autonomous, to give up the tendency to sort of break away, there has to be big costs. And once there is an advantage to being in a group, uh, it now becomes possible to give up some autonomy and still do well. But once you've given up some of these capacities to go back, you're now addicted and stuck. Uh, 
I think that that's a, an important part of the transition to eusociality that we've not been paying a lot of attention to. How is it um, that the, the component organisms in a social group um, have gained enough support by being social, by being collective, um, that in a sense they are, and I won't I, I'll anthropomorphize it by saying they're willing to give up the possibility of becoming autonomous again. Um, I think that one of the reasons that this happens is because the longer you are dependent, the more likely the autonomous capac capabilities are going to degrade. Uh, I think that's the same for addiction to opium, but I also suspect it plays a role in these other kinds of processes that addict us, so to speak, to be components in a larger social group. My suspicion is, for humans, that this has two parallels. One is our addiction to the social group for, its, for our language. We can't have a language if we're not in a social group. We're addicted to a linguistic unit. Um, and that also addicts us to the culture that goes along with it. Um, but in addition to this, with our current situation, we're becoming addicted to our technologies, addicted to our communication systems. Um, we can't do any longer without the devices that we're talking on, uh, whether they're cell phones or internet and so on. Um, it's given us incredible capabilities, but we now really can't go back easily without tremendous costs. You use, uh, Terry, a wonderful example that I'll, um, I'll bring up of uh, vitamin C dependence, basically, that many species can manufacture their own vitamin C. Uh, but in some species, their environment has abundant vitamin C. And so any mutation that knocks out the ability to synthesize it doesn't matter. And so, uh, and so these uh, organisms then lose the ability to manufacture it themselves. It's of no consequences uh, because it's available in the environment. But then they become addicted, as you say. Uh, they can no longer live in environments without vitamin C. So that's a really nice example. And what you're saying here is that, is that uh, this is what takes place in major transitions. You become a member of a group. That group becomes very cooperative. Other members are doing things that you used to have to do by yourself. Now you don't need to anymore. That degrades, and now you're addicted. I think, of course, the addiction here is a very good addiction. One problem with that word, of course, is that it has such negative connotations. But this is a positive addiction. Um, and uh, But, but uh, apart from that, I think it's a very important concept that you've developed. And, and I think it's um, a very important part of uh, all major evolutionary transitions. Well, I want to come back to something that uh, Vizici started, and that is uh, uh, the, the, the origin of the eukaryotic cell, right? As we said, the, the mitochondria, you know, these little power plants, once upon a time were free living bacteria. Now, if you look at mitochondria today, you see that the vast majority of the original genes that they had in them were lost, and the fraction now of those genes are in the nucleus, the cell nucleus of the whole cell. So this has several consequences. One of them is that uh, the mitochondrion cannot escape uh, from the cell now. It's impossible because you would leave your the, the, the genes that help you to function, some of the genes, most of the genes are actually outside of you. So you cannot just grab them, you know, they don't have a hand to do this operation. So they cannot get out. And the second thing is that they also cannot have cancer. There is no mitochondrial cancer because the reproduction of the mitochondria is now controlled by the nucleus, which gives us this idea that we introduced with John, the, the, the phenomenon of contingent irreversibility, which means that uh, things are not logically uh, impossible to reverse, but you would have so many uh, uh, reverse uh, steps uh, to do that it's for all practical purposes, it's impossible to do. That's the contingent irreversibility which, which, which entrenches many of these transitions. Yeah, I think it's important to add, though, that even after you become addicted, then it's still possible for mutations to occur that, that are regarded as parasitic. You haven't left the cell, but you're still not contributing to the cooperation. Uh, you still might be disrupting coordination. 
uh, you still might be cancerous. So, so this addiction concept, while very important, uh, does not solve those particular problems. So I think that's an important to get out there as well. So I was I was going to say, just in addition to that, I mean, the, the story uh, is not just the mitochondria. Not only have they lost close m over 90%, and this is true of their genome, but as have chloroplasts, uh, that that also the nuclear cell, the, the cell that they have maybe been in, incorporated into is also now dependent on mitochondria. It's lost its ability to do energy production. So in a sense, it's co-addiction um, or maybe co-dependency that we're really talking about here. Uh, and um, this notion of endosymbiosis, um, and whether it's our own uh, endosymbionts or, or the endosymbionts uh, in various insects that allow them uh, to, for example, to digest cellulose and so on. Um, basically, uh, each becomes degraded with respect to the other because of their cooperation. Uh, and just to sort of shift back to where we began, um, there is now, since the 90s, since the time that Orsch and others began talking about these transitions and this kind of a contingent irreversibility issue. Um, it's now become a major part of discussing uh, molecular evolution within the cell. How it is that, for example, the spliceosome evolved and so on. Uh, there is a kind of similar argument. It's sometimes been called um, contingent uh, neutral evolution or DDC, duplication, degeneration, and complementation. The interesting thing is that DDC um, parallels Darwin in an interesting way, in a slightly different way. D, duplication, uh, is multiplication, is reproduction. Um, degeneration is variation. Um, complementation is, in a sense, what adaptation is, fitting. DDC is a variant at the molecular level, at the social level. Um, that's a variant of the Darwinian model, but it's not quite the same. And the reason it's not the same is that complementation occurs within a unit. Competition occurs between units. Uh, but the same logic is there all the way up and down. And that means that that logic is probably also relevant to the logic that we're going to be talking about when it comes to human beings. Wow. So uh, basically, it's taken us uh, two hours to get to this point, And then we have the whole human phenomenon, the phenomenon of human, the human phenomenon, which is the correct translation of Tehard's book, um, uh, to uh, go in a second session. So, uh, uh, gentlemen, it's been so wonderful. What a ride. And uh, I look forward to part two of this, uh, which itself is part of our um, series on the science of the uh, noosphere.